الحمد لله رب العالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد النبي العالمين الذي اسمه مكتوب في الإنجيل والتوراة أما بعد وقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه العزيز بعد عود بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما ما ينفع الناس فيمكث في الأرض وقال جل وعلا في مقام آخر ومن الناس من يشري نفسه ابتغاء مرضات الله والله رؤوف بالعباد وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أبا سفيان جئتكم بكرامة الدنيا والآخرة أسلم تسلم وكما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم Dear brothers and sisters If we were to try to reflect upon a single word in the Quran or for that sake even in a hadith that can define the world in our life in the world just through one word and if we were to study Quran hadith and try to take out this one word and, hon- and, and, and dive into all of that which is mentioned and just find one word that can truly define the reality of life that one word will be life is a test that is the word that is used by Allah to define life what is life? وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنِ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْسٍ مِّنِ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ Life is a test. The great Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah would say, أَصْلُ الدُّنْيَا الْبَلَاء That the reality of life is that it is an examination hall. It's a test for you. And every single person has a different test. There's no two people who have the same exam. There's no person that you can look into and say, hey man, I see your answers, I see your questions. Everyone has a different exam, everyone has a different formula, everyone has a different process, but life through the words of Allah is a test. Now like any other test in the world, it can become difficult, it can become, it can become demanding, it can make you anxious, it can make you angry, it can make you tired, it can, make you, it can bring you down, and at times it can bring you up, it can make you hopeless, it can make you lose the, the reality of why you're even doing it. But just like that, life is the same. It has the same aspect of an exam. How do you keep yourself confined to that which you're doing in, in, in life when you have a true exam or a real exam? You keep your eye on the prize. You're told in two years you'll be done and this is what you'll have. In five years you'll be wearing this and you'll be earning this. In 10 years you'll be the dean of this Keeping your eye ahead and your eye on the prize is what keeps us motivated and what keeps us moving. Similarly, the one formula, the one answer that can be utilized for every single person in their different exams is to make sure we realize that the purpose of the exam is not to pass in this world. We don't want to see ans- we don't want to see the results of our answers in this world. We don't per se want to see the fruits of our answers to this exam in this world. Our results and our fruits and and the purpose of all of this will be reflected to us in the Akhirah if we are able to keep the prize in front of us. What is the prize? What keeps us moving forward? What motivates us? The prize is very simple. The prize is Allahu Samad. The prize is having the rida and the pleasure of Allah. The prize is having Allah being happy with you. The gift is having Allah's happiness in your life. The gift is having Allah mention your name within the group in the gatherings of angels. Man dhakarani fi nafsi, dhakartuhu fi nafsi. Whosoever thinks of me, whosoever thinks of me for a moment, I think of him or her. Man dhakarani fi majlisin, and whosoever speaks about me in a gathering, Guess what? I speak about them in a gathering far greater and far more superior than the feeble gatherings that we sit in. Allah says, keep your eye on the prize. The prize is Allah will be with us. The, 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 the problem with us and anyone living in the world, we're living in a time which is riddled with confusion. It's difficult. It becomes challenging. We forget who Allah is. So to keep Allah as a prize, it's important to realize who Allah is and what Allah can truly do for us. Who is Allah? How do you define Allah? 
How do I recognize who Allah is? Allahu alladhi khalaqa sab'a samawatin. Allahu alladhi khalaqa samawati wal ard. Allahu alladhi khalaqa kum min nafsin wahida. Allah is who? Allah is the one that gave us life. Ibn Qayyim says the greatest blessing is wujud. Is we're actually alive. That is a blessing. Allah gave us a family. Allah gave us eyesight. Allah gave us wealth. Allah gave us peace. If Allah gave it to us, Allah can take it from us. Lillahi ma a'ta wa lillahi ma akhar. Allah can give it and Allah can take it. La yas'alu amma yas'alu wa hum yus'alun. No one can question the decree or the order and the judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah controls everything. وَلَا يَؤُوذُهُ حِفْظُهُمَا وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ Nothing can make Allah become tired. So if that Allah is available for us, normally people of such a nature don't have time for lower people like us. But Allah says, hey, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ You ask about me and I'm right next to you. وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَمَا كُنْتُمْ I'm with you at every single turn of your life. In those moments that every single person goes through, regardless if you're enjoying life or if you're struggling in life, there are moments in your life where you think to yourself that who is really with me? How did my father just pass away? How did I have, how did I lose my child? How is it possible that I lost my job? How is it possible that I don't have anyone to be with? How is it possible? وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ Allah is there for you. Allah is there for us. The simplest, the simplest friend that we can have is Allah. Because he, no, he has no exterior demands. You know what Allah wants from you. Allah already has put it forth for you. How do we connect ourselves to that Allah? Allah says in Hadith Al-Qudsi, يَا بْنَ آدَمْ لَوْ إِنَّ أَوَّلَكُمْ وَآخِرَكُمْ وَإِنْسَكُمْ وَجِنَّكُمْ إِجْسَمَهُ عَلَى سَعِيدٍ وَاحِدٍ if every single person gathered upon one plane, one land, one area, and at one time instantly echoed their own desires and needs, and at that moment they would be given everything that they want, and nothing would decrease from my kingdom. Nothing would decrease. And I'm not a person who gives and reminds you that I gave. I'm a person that gives, you sin, and I give you again. وَلَوْ يَأَخِذُ اللَّهُ النَّاسَ بِمَا كَسَبُوا مَا تَرَكَ عَلَى ظَهْرِيَا مِنْ دَابَ Allah says, if my giving you was based in proportionate to your obedience, if my giving you was based in proportionate to your obedience, you would not have a single blessing left in your life. Because eyes are given as a blessing and eyes look at wrong. Ears are given as a blessing and ears listen to haram. The tongue is given as a blessing and hearts are broken by that tongue. Hands are given as a blessing and people are hurt by our arms and our hands. The li- our life is given as a blessing. Yet, there are, exterior, there, there, are second, there are primary purposes of our life for us other than the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, Ya ibn Adam, ma ansaftani, khalaqtuka wa lam taku shay'a, wa ja'altuka basharan sawi'a. Allah says, O oh, son of Adam, you have not done justice to me. Allah is speaking to us. 89 times in the Qur'an, Allah speaks to just believers. Just to believers. Where Allah is, in those 6,200 plus verses, in 89 of them, Allah is speaking to every single one of us. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. Oh, the ones that believe, that have iman. In those 89, there's 35 to 40 commandments. Some are repetition. Allah is saying, Ya bina Adam. Oh, son of Adam, you haven't shown justice to me. Like, you haven't been fair to me in this relationship. It hasn't been reciprocal. That's not, that's messed up. How have you not been fair? I made you when you were nothing. You had nothing on you. Your life, there was absolutely no form of a blessing in your life. And I made you a person. Allah says, Ya bin Adam, you had hands but you were unable to grab. You had a tongue, but you were unable to articulate anything. You had feet and you couldn't walk. You had nothing. And then you became something. Right? Allah made us from, from, a, from a weak being. 
and then He gave our body strength. He made, He morphed us into what we are now. All of that is a blessing. To understand what our actual goal in life is, one has to recognize the greatness of Allah. In order for me to go through the 12 years of medical school, I better know that I will be rewarded for it once I finish. In order for me to go through any struggle in life, there has to be a purpose. If I'm doing, a, if I'm doing any form of an act without a purpose, that's what you call a person that is, doing, that is living life without a, in complete vain. Why are you doing it for? I don't know, man. I'm just doing it. Well, you're wasting your life. Why are we doing all of this? Why was all of this put down for us? So that we can earn Allah's pleasure. Now, this pleasure of Allah at times can manifest itself in ease and at times can manifest itself in difficulties. My difficulties in life are not a definition of Allah being displeased with me. And my ease in life is not the definition of Allah being happy. Neither is it vice versa. Once I recognize this is Allah who I want, everything else is background music. If I have it, I have it. If I don't have it, I don't have it. Us people living in America, we are considered rich in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, where majority of my ummah will be poor. Go to our countries, see people living there. When you go for a hajj, people come from such poor places, man. They have nothing on them. There was a group with me, there was a group of people, with, uh, people in Arafah, not from America. They came from Uganda. And I promise you, like if poverty, if poverty had, you know, uh, had, a, had like a gauging factor that we could gauge it by, they were, you know, the poorest of people. They had nothing. They were literally sitting down on the side of the road and people would pass by and had your given, you know, um, boxes of food. And those people that had boxes that were left would pass by and give it to them. And they were sitting there so relaxed. Such ease. Because they know that, hey man, what is to come is much better than that which you have. What is to come is ease. The person that is studying at 12 a.m. at night knows that if I study properly, I'll have ease in my life for the rest of my life. I'll have ease. If one is struggling with, a, with any form of hardship, they should also remember that there is ease that will come. There is ease. May it be in dunya, may it be in akhirah. The tough reality and a tough pill to swallow for us is that ease is not always shown to people in dunya. Some people live their entire lives in poverty. Some people live their entire lives without having children. Some people live their entire lives without seeing their parents. That's a reality. But they keep themselves connected to Allah. So what is to come is better for them than that, has, that which has passed. On the Day of Judgment, when a person enters into Jannah, Allah will say to them, هَلْ رَأَيْتَ مِنِّي شَرٌ قَطُّ Have you ever seen any difficulty in your life? And the man that enters into Jannah or that person that enters into Jannah will say, Ya Allah, ma ra'aytu sharrun qattu. I have never seen difficulty because I see what I, re what I receive from him. I've, I've gone in Jannah, look at, look at what I have. I have eternal bliss. I have your happiness on the day in Jannah, Allah will come out and he will, he will say to the believers that will, that will be in Jannah, hopefully may Allah make us amongst us, he will say to them that, is there anything else that I can give you? And we will respond, Ya Allah, قَدْ بَيَّطَّ وَجُوهَنَا وَدَخَلَنَا الْجَنَّةِ You've made our face radiant with light and you've given us Jannah. What else can we ask for? And Allah will descend in His فَيَكْشِفُ الْحِجَابِ And Allah will expose Himself. And in, in, in the, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ says in Tirmidhi that there will be nothing that will be more beautiful for anyone in Jannah than the pleasantry of looking at Allah's face. And in that moment, Allah will say, You want something better? Let me tell you. My happiness is forever with you. My happiness is forever with you. I will never become angry at you. I will never become upset at you. I will never ever have to punish you. I'm happy with you. That's the goal. This is just background music. You know, Umar once said, when speaking to his companions, he said, Ala inna dunya mudbiratan wal akhiratu muqbilatan. Which means, hey, hey, realize dunya is something which is mudbira. Mudbira comes from the root letters of dubur, which means something which is behind. Something which is behind. Wal akhiratu muqbilatan. And the akhirah is something which is in front of you. 
how that works from, from what I understand from it is imagine driving in a car from anywhere and there's something you want from the back seat. You want something from the back seat or you want something from the trunk. If you're driving, looking ahead, the only way you can get something from the back seat is not by turning your face to the back and looking for that, but rather just whatever comes in your hand, you'll grab it and you'll bring it to the front. You're not going to turn your whole body and say, hey man, where's my food at? Where's my mom's biryani? All right, I need my brother ate it. You're just, whatever you grab, I got a date, whatever, that's good enough, and eat it. You don't turn your whole body. What you do is you ask the person next to you, hey man, can you grab what's in the back? And if you really want to grab it, you have to stop your car, pull up to the shoulder, go in the back, grab it, get back in the car, turn it back on, and then drive. That's how dunya works with akhirah. If we're, move, if we're moving towards muqabilatan, towards the akhirah, the way to take from the dunya is without removing our eyes from the akhirah. This is the prize, and whatever I get with it, I'll take with it. And if I stop my progression towards the akhirah, that's when I'm taking more from the dunya. Man ahabba dunyahu abarra bi akhiratihi, wa man ahabba akhiratahu abarra bi dunyahu. Fa'athiru ma yubqa ala ma yufna. The Prophet says, whosoever has dear and dire love for dunya. Wanting dunya is not wrong. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا It's perfectly fine. But if that becomes your complete purpose of life, there will be, there will be definite harm that will be found within our akhirah. There has to be. And whosoever loves their akhirah, they will find some harm in their dunya. Because Allah tests people who have, who have iman. Allah doesn't test people who don't have iman. Allah is testing me because I have iman. Allah is testing me because I do pray. Allah is testing me because I do fast. It's a sign of Allah's love. It's a sign that Allah is thinking of me. How do I get through it? Keeping Allah in front of me. The greatest man that walked this earth, was given the trials and tribulations like nobody else. Like nobody else. Why was it so the Prophet was born without a father? Why was it, why was it fair? How was it fair that the Prophet's mother was snatched from him at the age of six? How was it fair that the Prophet's grandfather was taken from him at the age of eight? How was it fair that his only beloved wife Khadija was taken from him? How was it fair that his uncle was taken from him? How was it fair that his uncle Hamza was taken from him? How was it fair that out of his children, only one survived before his death and the rest of them he buried with his own hands? How was it fair? What is coming for you is much better than what you already have. Your eyes were set on the prize. The Prophet ﷺ was sitting and Umar walks inside of the house عنه, and he sees the, the lines in the back of Umar. And Umar gets upset. Ya Rasulullah, the people of Kisra and Qaisar are enjoying on the most lavish and comfortable sofas and cushions and you don't have something to lay on that can't harm your back? What fairness is this? And the Prophet ﷺ got up and he smiled at Umar. He said, Ya Umar, won't you be happy if we have akhirah and they have dunya? And they don't have akhirah and they only have dunya? Wala tahsaban. Allah in the Quran makes it clear for us that, of course, Allah, we hope that everyone gets hidayah. But Allah said that don't think, don't think. Those that are doing good in this world are doing good because they're better than us. They're doing good because that's all they're getting. And we're struggling because we have much more that is left. There's much more left for us. Oh no, don't worry. We'll get it in the akhirah. And we'll get much more than this. How is it so that the man who, has been, who had been given the, the, the proposition that just say the word in the, the, the mountain of Uhud will become gold for you, not figuratively, literally. It will become gold for you and you'll have anything you want. Just say the word, man. Imagine someone comes to us and say, man, hey man, want to become a millionaire? Just say, I want to become a millionaire. Man, I'll take care of my dunya, but you know, akhirah will come. Just give it to me. The Prophet says, hey, no, no, I don't want it. I don't want it. Why don't I want it? Not because I can't bring a balance into my life. No. Of course, a prophet could always bring a balance to his life. I don't want it because I know majority of my ummah will be masakin and fuqara, and I want to be with them. I don't want to be amongst others. 
I want to be with the poor people. So now he's walking in the streets and with Ibn Umar anhuma, and as he's walking, he finds a date on the ground and he picks it up. He picks up the date that was hanging on the dirt of the street. And he says to Ibn Umar, Awatashtahihi, do you desire this date? You want it? Are you hungry? And Ibn Umar says, what? Bro, you just picked up a date from the ground, man. You're offering me a date, you picked up from the ground? The Prophet says, Ya Ibn Umar, walakin ana ashtahi. I want it. Why do I want it for? Hadihi subhu rabi'in ma duqtu shay'ah. Ya Ibn Umar, this is the fourth consecutive morning that not a morsel of food has entered into my mouth. I want it, I need it. The Prophet is sitting there in the masjid and he's praying sitting down and the color and the complexion of his face has become pale. Abu Hurairah walks in and he says, Ya Rasulullah, ma li ara atagayyar wajha lawnak. Why do I see that the complexion of your face has been taken away? You've become so pale. Prophet says to him, Ya Bahur al-Jur, al-Jur, I'm just hungry man. He's really hungry. How is it so that this man was in hunger if it was okay not to struggle? It was the success of this world for the Akhirah is inseparable from struggling in this life. It's inseparable because every single person that will earn Jannah will go through some form of difficulty. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا means that there has to be some form of a rebuttal. There has to be an antagonist. There has to be something that makes it difficult for us or else it ain't really a test. And everyone's test will be different. The Prophet ﷺ in the battle of Khandaq and this is a one hadith in which the narrator, the person that is narrating the hadith and the, and the Prophet ﷺ, neither of them said a word. Neither of them said a word. They both just used sign language. Umar in the expedition of Khandaq walks up with the Prophet and he looks at him, hey, Ya Rasulullah, look at this man. Puts up his shirt, just points. Look. Prophet looks at it, he gets out of the trench, picks up his shirt. You see this now? No need for words. That's the struggle. That's the struggle. When the Prophet passed, Urwa ibn Zubair عن, asked his aunt, Aisha radiallahu anha, that, oh my mother, why was it so when the Prophet ﷺ left this world, you had not turned on the lamp so people could walk in and see the blessed face of the Prophet ﷺ. They could see him. When Abu Bakr walked in, I mean, Abu Bakr was a beast in every form. He, you know, if some people have highlights in their life, highlights, imagine if your whole life is a highlight screen. That was Abu Bakr Every moment of his life was a highlight. One time a man came to Umar radiallahu anhu and he said to him, Ya Ibn Umar, anta khayru min Abi Bakr. You know some guys really try to get you pumped up, right? You're better than Abu Bakr. Yeah, yeah. if it was us, brother, can you just put it on Facebook too? Just, just share, on your, share on your story that I, I know about, you know, I want to make sure everyone knows about it. It's just me. I, don't preach to the choir, right? Umar says, brother, Laylatun wahidatun wa yawmun wahid khayrun min Umar wa Ali Umar. One day, in one night, from the life of this great person is better than the entire life and family and children of, of Umar radiallahu anhu. What was the one day? The day when the Prophet passed away and he was a rock solid person. And the night was a night of, of hijrah. A man came to Ali radiallahu anhu, karramullah wajh, and he asked him, Ya Ali, man aqwa min as sahaba who was the strongest from the sahaba? And there is no doubt that the strongest among sahaba in the form of physical strength was Ali radiallahu anhu. Umar was rough. Khalid was a strategic person. Ali had just, just bare strength, right? You couldn't mess with him. In the battle of the Khandaq, when a man jumped over the trench, one man, finally, after 12 days, was, was managed to jump over the trench. And he was known as Amr ibn Wud. He was a man that when he would sit on the horse, his legs would touch the ground. Everyone, his, his nickname was Al-Asad. He was a lion. So when he jumped over the trench, the Prophet looked at the Sahaba and he said, hey, you know, we need, some, we need someone to take care of him. Who's going who's to take care of him? Everyone's quiet. Ali raises his hand. So, Ali, put your hand down. You're still young. You just got married. Put your hand down. Ali, it's okay. He asks again, 
Ali raises his hand. Put your hand down, man. Third time, he raises his hand again. Then the Prophet allows him to go. The Rawi says, when we saw the Prophet when we saw Ali walking away from the Prophet, the Prophet turned his whole body away from him. And we saw the Prophet was tearing because this, this youngster just got married and he was his beloved son-in-law and his, and his cousin. Young man. And he, of course, the Prophet didn't know that which was unseen. This man walks up to this enemy of Islam and this guy jumps off the horse and he says to him that, Hey, I don't want to kill you, you're just a kid. Ali says, hey, well, I can, I know, Udid, but I want to take care of you. Come out. All right? And he says, لا تعجلن فقد أتاك مجيب صوتك من غير عاجز بنية وبصيرة Don't get excited. You know, someone gets excited. Like, you think you're going you to win. Don't get excited, brother. I'm here for you. Your response has come. And within moments, he was on the ground. So out of sheer power, there was no one like Ali. He said, Abu Bakr. Not because he was stronger, but he said that which was done by Abu Bakr on that one night when he carried the Prophet on his back was unparalleled to what we can do. He has to be that person. He comes in and the Prophet is laying there and his face is covered. He uncovers the face of the Prophet. And he says, Wa khalila. Oh my friend. Right? Imagine that emotional, the, the, the internal attachment that Abu Bakr had with the Prophet being the first to accept and literally being the second to the Prophet at everything. The second to be born after the Prophet, the second to accept Islam after the Prophet, the second in Hijrah, the second in everything, even in death. The Prophet is laying there, and we can realize, we, we, we know the Prophet's beauty didn't become less when he went. Yeah, the, the poet says, Oh, the one that was lowered into, lowered into his grave, the ground, the earth became more fresh and, and fragrant by you going inside. Right, his beauty didn't get less. He comes, he says, Wa oh my, oh my beloved friend. Wa Rasula, oh my Prophet. And he kisses him on the forehead. Tibta hayyan wa mayyitan. Oh Prophet, you are beautiful when you are alive and you're as beautiful as you have left the world. Your beauty has not diminished. You'll always be beautiful. Yes, the world has become darker. Anas ibn Malik says, anhu, that lamma dakhala al-nabiyyu when the Prophet entered into Medina, the entire city lit up. It lit up. Now you know when someone that you're waiting for walks inside of the hall, lights up the hall. Lights up the hall, like a bride on her, on her wedding. Not a groom. It's a bride, right? Lights up the entire hall. Seeing your mother after being away for a year, she lights up your life. It's not a figure of speech. It's, a, it's true. It, uh, you actually feel it. Seeing your son after work, it lights up your day. You know, I met someone in Pennsylvania and his son had a disease where his body was not growing, but his mind was growing. So he was growing older in age, but he was still very small. And he was one of the happiest guys I've met. Everyone's test is different. Everyone's questions are different. But the answer is the same. Have Allah in front of us. He would say, when he, went to, when, when he took me to his house, I personally wouldn't think that this person was struggling like that. Because you don't, you never, the person next to you may be going through something which is harder than you. And a true, the, the true sign of sabrun jameel is لا أثر ولا شكوى إلا لله Nobody knows your struggle but Allah. Nobody knows your struggle. Only Allah knows. The Prophet has been described to be دائمو التبسم that he was always smiling. And he has also been described to be دائمو الحزن he was always in sorrow and grief. How do you consolidate both of these descriptions which are completely contrary to each other? He was always smiling, yet he was always grieving. He was always smiling when in front of people because putting on a good face for his sahabas. And he was always grieving when he was alone. And that's when he was crying to Allah. Smiling in front of people. When the Prophet passes, when he came into Medina, Allah kulla shay. And when he passed away, Adlama kulla shay. Everything became dark. Everything was taken away. The man asked his aunt, why did you not have light in that room? It doesn't make sense to me. Aisha responds to him and says, Oh my dear nephew, I promise you if I had oil to light up the lamp, I would have drank it. I would have taken it. Our, in our house, we would see a moon, a second moon, and a third moon. رَأَيْنَا الْهِلَالِ ثُمَّ رَأَيْنَا الْهِلَالِ ثُمَّ رَأَيْنَا الْهِلَالِ Three months would pass by. In our, sta in our stove would never turn on. It wouldn't turn on. That's difficulty. But yet the greatest, the greatest reward is given because of that difficulty. 
And through that we're all Muslims. So our difficulty is incentivized by people coming closer to Allah. If our diffi- we, all, we all go through difficulties, but the difficulties may have different objectives. I struggle for work, but I struggle for work to make money. I struggle for school. Well, I struggle for school to get a degree. I struggle for Allah. That struggle is speaking to Allah. That struggle is making dua. That struggle is sitting in the middle of the night and crying to Allah. إِذْ نَادَ رَبَّهُ نِدَاءً خَفِيَّةً When Zakaria is speaking about how he would make dua to Allah. إِذْ نَادَ رَبَّهُ نِدَاءً خَفِيَّةً Allah says about his dua, when he describes the dua of Zakaria, he would constantly turn towards me khafiya when no one was around him. It was hidden. Aisha radiallahu anha says that one day the Prophet enters my room, lays next to me, فَالطَّجْعَ bijambi. He lays next to me. I mean, imagine having the Prophet alive in such close proximity. Right? That is Jannah. One Sahaba came to the Prophet and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm sad. So why are you sad for, brother? He says, I was thinking about Jannah. Are you okay? You're thinking about Jannah and you're sad? Right? You should be thinking about Jannah and get happy. And no, no, I thought about Jannah and I realized that you'll be up there and I'll be down here. I'll have everything, but I won't have your companionship. Is that really a Jannah for me? The Prophet smiled at him and said, No, no, Al Maru Ma'aman Ahab. You'll be with whom you love. If you love me, you'll be with me. A Sahaba asked the Prophet, Sallallahu Malik radiallahu anhu, what a profound question. He said, Ya Rasulullah, where will I find you on the day of judgment? What a nice question. You know, some people have good questions, some people have not so good questions. <laughs> yeah, everyone has a good question. Right? He says, where will I find you on the day of judgment? Like, there's going to be so many people there. I want to know where I can find you, man. The Prophet says, let me tell you, three spots, you'll find me in one of these three spots. Number one, ala sirat, you'll find me on the bridge. And I'll be on that bridge, and I'll be picking people up that are about to fall, that are stumbling. I'll grab them and I'll take them forward. And I'll be making dua, Allahumma sallim, Allahumma sallim, oh Allah, please, allow them to pass, allow them to pass. And I'll have my people with me, like Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali, who are also helping, pushing people forward, helping them, ushering them. Ushering them past the sirat, right? Isn't that, isn't that the word we use about ushering, right? Ushering them past the sirat. And then Allah, then the Prophet says, if you don't find me there, where can you find me? Where the scales are being weighed. And I'll be making dua under the arsh of Allah. Allahumma thaqir, Allahumma thaqir. Oh Allah, make it heavier. Oh Allah, make it heavier. If you can't find me there, you'll definitely find me on the hawth of kawthah. You'll find me. You'll find me where I'll be giving water to every single believer. That's where you'll find me. Their worry was, Will I be with the Prophet? It wasn't whether, if I'm struggling right now, man, how am I going to get through this? If I'm struggling right now, think about seeing the face of the Prophet in Jannah. Think about him coming to you and saying, hey man, you made it. You made it. Think about Allah calling out that I'm never going to get angry at you again. Think about being with Sahabas. Think about being with your parents. Allah says in the Quran that, you know, you would ask that, what is Jannah without my parents? Right? What is Jannah without my loved ones? And if though for those that have not lost loved ones, then that perhaps doesn't strike a chord. But for those that have lost parents or young or kids or, or, or a spouse or a grandmother or a grandfather, what will Jannah be if I'm not with them? Allah says, don't worry. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَّةٌ بِإِيمَانٍ أَلْحَقْنَا بِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّةٌ وَمَا أَلَتْنَاهُمْ مِنْ عَمَلِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Whosoever believes, I will, I will connect them with their parents. I will connect them with their children. And I won't take the person on top lower. I'll take the one lower and move them above. You know, normally if your fam- if you're, if you're, um, spouse or if your brother or sister, whoever it is, is in business lounge, in the business class, and you're in economy, the only way you can be together is what? They come back. It's not like, hey, my, my, you know, my husband, you know, my, my brother is in business class. Can I also go with brother? He'll come here. Right? And most likely or not, the guy will say, your spouse or your father or mother, whoever, hey, you stay there, I'm staying here. <laughs> don't worry, I don't, I don't miss you that much. We can wait eight hours. Allah will take us from below and take us above to be with us. Allah will elevate us, not descend us. Allah will take us up to be with us. Imagine now, being close to the Prophet. And Aisha says, there was nothing more beloved to me at that time than having the Prophet next to me. He looks at me and says, Ya Aisha, أَسْتَأْذِنُ أَنْ أَتَعَبَّدَ رَبِّي عَزَّ وَجَلْ Can I go and pray some... Can I pray some salat? 
And Aisha says, ah. You know, anyone that's gone to Medina, leaving Medina is difficult, right? Leaving Medina is, 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 a, is a mission, right? I mean, it's perhaps one of the most difficult things to do on that trip is to leave Medina. She says, go ahead, Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet starts praying. And she says, he starts praying, and I see him tearing, his beard gets wet, he goes into ruku, his, the ground gets wet, he goes into sajda, I think he's about to pass away because how long his sajda is, continues all the way till fajr, and I look to him and I say to him, Ya Rasulullah, has Allah not forgiven your sins? Why are you killing yourself for it? Figuratively. Why, figure of speech. Why are you killing yourself for it? And the Prophet says, Afala akuna abdan shukura. I want to become someone that can show my gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In that difficulty, there was this. In that difficulty, for us dear sisters and brothers, in this ease, what are we doing? This is ease. We have a beautiful room. We have our families, we have our homes. In this ease, what are we doing? When was the last time I actually sat down for a few moments and just said, you know what? Nothing else but raising my hands. Nothing else but turning towards Allah. 